Ready whenever you Shalom Aleichem, welcome. Welcome to Meaningful Interviews. We have back no, uh, a, we have back a popular a popular guest, Reb Yaakov. I cannot hear you. Hold on. He cannot hear me. You're muted somehow. You can hear me? I cannot hear you. Okay, now you can hear me? I do not hear you. So, I don't know what to check here. Um, I heard you before when we started, but... Zoom meeting. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Now I hear you. I had a I had a headphone plug in. Okay. Bye -bye. Okay. So welcome to our uh, meaningful me interviews. Me um, interviews with Reb ya um, Reb Yaakov Hamnik, who we had on before Baruch Hashem, and uh, it was uh, very successful. Uh, and continues. People continue. So today is an Epshlema. Carol Bach's yard site. Um, Reb Shlema, uh, Yaakov, Reb Yaakov knew him, so I wanted to hear from him, really, uh, mostly. I won't be saying much. I've written a book about it. Reb Yaakov read it. I'm sure he has much to say. But um, today, tell tell me what you know about Reb Shlema. And of course, um, what everyone wonders about is, on one hand, he was Makad of so many Yidin, and surely, um, has been the sky and has been fulfilled by him a hundredfold. And, uh, like I told you when we spoke about my book, that as a bacher, you know, uh, in Lubavitch and in many other uh, communities, yeshivas, he was a taboo. And, uh, I started to research his life and, and, and different things. I gained, uh, a, respect uh, for him, uh, although, you know, there were certain issues, I, of course, I, it's not just I, that I uh, couldn't, you know, agree with and, 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 and say it's sanctioned and say it's okay, but the, the overall the thing that he did for Yiddentum, for Yiddishkeit, for Judaism, is unparalleled. It's just, uh, it's a fact. It's not, it's not, it's not the, you know, uh, uh, my belief, your belief, it's, it's a fact on the ground to look around the world and see families and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and they're all that Shloim is um, doing from, from way back. So, but you knew him, so I would like to hear, and your father surely knew him, I, I know that, because he was in Chaim Berlin, and um, I'm sure you're, he was very close to your father. So tell me your thoughts, please, Rabbi <laughs> Well, first of all, I always, you know, I always remind everybody that the Abish to made that Shlaima Kalbach and Rav Shach have the same yard site. So, <laughs> to kind of a way of showing that the Ava and the Yure are all part of the Shlaima supply. So, but uh, so I, I'll give you, try to give you a flavor of what it was like for me growing up. It, uh, my father, Alba Shalom, had two albums from Shlomo Kalba. The first two albums, which is Hanasham Malach and then Baruch Inafshi, which came out, let's say, in 58 and 59 or something like that. Right. And, I was born, and I was born in 58. Okay. So it was, from, it was like, from the time I discovered, my father never pointed me to them, but I discovered them on, we had the, uh, you know, we had a shelf of records and I saw these two records, and and uh, I started listening to them, uh, especially when my mother was nifta. I was ten years old, so in that kufa, uh, I was listening really a lot because uh, I think it really helped me in a certain way through the avelas as a young kid standing right. saying. Uh, Rabbi Yaakov, sorry, could you translate everything into English if you can, so people yeah, yeah, who okay. don't know Hebrew avelas. Tukufa. Okay, no, no. Okay, excellent. Thanks for alerting me to that. I, yeah. I, I, I overlooked it. 
Yeah, so when my mother passed away when I was 10, uh, almost 11. And uh, so during that period, certainly, but until my father remarried, but even afterwards, to an extent, that during that year of uh, trying to deal with it, and don't forget, I, as a 10 year old kid, sang Kaddish. At the end of each prayer, I'm getting up there and saying Kaddish, uh, the prayer for, you know, for orphans. So when I was a real orphan, you know, like, like this, you see a guy at 50, his father died at 80. So, all right, you know, it's it's unfortunate, but you don't want to hug the guy. <laughs> it's not your first impulse. But for me, I was a 10, 10 11 year old kid, and I would get up and say Kaddish, and everyone in the synagogue immediately was, you know, pitying me. And and everyone looks at it's a spectacle, so so I couldn't really mourn in private too much, but and I needed to find ways to deal. And then I found these two albums among my father's uh, property. He was he was alive, but he was working crazy hours trying to pay for all the babysitter. He hired all kinds of people to take care of us, including uh, I should mention I haven't seen her in, I don't know fifty years, a girl named Debbie Pazipov. Uh, who, who was uh, Eddie uh, was uh, Josh Gordon's Rabbi Gordon, the Lubavitcher Shliach. Yeah, probably. I assume so. I, I didn't track her, but she she learned to base Rochelis. What's the Lubavitcher school? Base Rivka. Base Rivka. She learned to base Rivka. Yeah, she she was his wife. She is his wife. She lives in Encino, California. Oh, good. So I hope she has this somehow. I'm, I'm overcome with gratitude just to think of what she gave up every night. You know, my father paid up a big deal. She was a teenager. She was there every night. Sometimes her sister would join her. The sister wasn't even getting paid, but she'd come sometimes. So it was very, you know, a lot of very special people were trying to, you know, help. So I'm bringing this all in relation to Kabbalah, that the Kabbalah music captured me in this moment of a, of a real absence in my life. And somehow I, I connected with it in a deeper way. Now, my father always told me when I was a kid that Kava's first uh, guitar, he bought for $40. And he borrowed $20 from Rebaran Shechter, who later became, he should live and be well, he was the Rashid Mechaim And my father lent him the other 20 uh, I, I wanted to verify it. I should have trusted him with my father. But when I first time I met Kabach years later, the first, I asked him, you know, where did he get the money for his first guitar? And he said, yeah, your father gave, lent me 20, and Ryan Chester lent me 20. He said it right on the spot. So, you know, then I felt foolish about doubting. But at least I, I verified it in terms of history. You know, it's not just me trusting my father. He told me that himself. So that was a beautiful thing. Now, my father, my father really cut ties with Kabach because... He was disappointed in, in the direction it took. But the fact is that my father Kabach uh, were very close in the sense that they were both 25-year-old single guys at the same time. In, in, in the yeshiva world where there was not too many of those guys left, most people were married 22, 23, 24. My father didn't get married until a few months before his 26th birthday. So he, him and Kalbach would would hang out, uh, you know, in the Pioneer Hotel and these places where part of the idea was to meet women. You know, that was, I mean, whatever else was going on that night, maybe there was a concert, but that was part of the idea. So, but my father was very uh, conscious of like trying to do it in a sneeze to go away. Now today it doesn't exist anymore. You don't go someplace right. to meet women if you right. see them. It's a taboo. It's taboo, but yeah. But in those days, it was done. But yet, but there was a line like uh, it was a very subtle line. You had to be careful not to cross it. Where you know you make it's clear that you're a yeshiva bach. You're not doing anything physical or anything like that. You, and you, you and and you can meet a, a girl, you know, without a shidduch. But it has to be done very, in a very able way. So my father always was convinced that he had it. He had it down right, and he thought Kavach was being a little looser than it. So, so he, but uh, okay, but but there were still buddies, and uh, and doing that, and uh, also Kamba had uh, had tried a few jobs 
already, you know, because he didn't stay in yeshiva till 25. He tried some jobs. And uh, my father's impression was that he was a layitzlech, which is a, a, a Jewish way of saying that he, he tried, but he wasn't succeeding. He had a few different jobs. Uh, and one of them uh, was that he was, they made him the rabbi of a town in, in New Jersey where, where a group of Hungarian Jews who had come from Europe and still had European ideas had, made, had set up chicken farms and uh, near each other and they, had, and they created a shul for these individuals with the chicken farm. So, and they hired Kalbach as the rabbi for a while, but but these people were re- ignorant in the, in the classical sense. So, you know, the phrase Amaharitz, which is a Jewish phrase that means people of the earth. They were really people of the earth. They were farmers, even in America, didn't know a lot. They, they were drawn to him enough that they hired him, but he was really much more scholarly than them. And so he had to figure out how to come down to their level. And which, and he didn't last that long over there, but my father told me that when he would come, Kalbach would come to Camp Morris, which was the Chamberlain camp to this day. It, it, may, it may be in a different location now that it is, but it was the Chamberlain camp, Camp Morris, and Kalbach would come. And and everyone would hang out while he told stories, and he would imitate the accent of these Hungarian farmers exactly. And, and he was like a, a showman, a performer, before he was a singer. He just could get a crowd around him and start, to, you know, without Lush and Hara, but just to give a flavor of what right, it's like. Right, 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 right. And, and, so, uh, and so he was a real entertainer. He was a very entertaining guy. Everyone enjoyed being around him. But he wasn't making a living yet, you know. So And he wasn't getting married yet. So it, it, now if someone reads your book, they'll understand a lot of the background in terms of his family and the other things that were going on. But he, the Bachman didn't know that usually. They're dealing with a guy in yeshiva, it's sort of an enclosed world, it's a different environment. So he was considered to be a pretty good at learning, you know. And one of the things about later, once I knew Kalvas personally, one of the things about him, which was interesting, is that uh, yeah, he, when Yeshiva Baruch would crowd around him, you know, sometimes he'd make a concert and he'd, he'd do, his regular vibe was speaking to ordinary people and trying to draw them in. But sometimes Yeshiva Baruch would show up. So it threw him off his game a little bit. But then later, once he said goodbye to all the regular people, the Yeshiva Baruch would hang around a lot of times and start smooth with him, try to get him to say something and learn it, you know. And so in that environment, he, 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 like reverted back to his being a yeshiva, uh, taught to describe, and he and he would start, and he'd be a little braggadocious about, you know, yeah, and the Baron Kotler shared, you know, there were only two guys who really understood the share, uh, rebellious way, and me, you know, he, he'd, say, he'd say stuff like that, yeah, but I, but and I could tell, you know, I would, I never was the was the nerd asking the questions. Because I thought, like, that's not cool, you know. But there was always guys, and, 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 is it true that you and mom is the best book I like with? Is it true? No. <laughs> it, would be, it would be a little stupid like that. And he would, and and he it would bring out another part of him. He'd be a little off his game. Because like this, he, when he was the performer and he controlled the environment, he's able to give a certain impression. When these guys would crowd around him, you know, because he, he, he had a connection in his heart to the Yeshiva world, you know, like uh, in the other connection to the Yeshiva world, no question. But on the other hand, he was sort of out there. So, so when these clusters of people from those worlds would show up, it, it, it was, you know, like the option of a, I compare it to the option of a Rebbe, because the, the option of a Rebbe is a certain way. And when he comes into a room, the room is transformed. Everyone is, you know, you see a real side of and so every interaction with him, he, he's able to control the interaction. He, he, not, he doesn't seem to make an effort to control it, it's just the aura that he has controls it. Right. With, with Kalbach, because he was a hamid, you know, there's a lot of his Talmudim called the Rebbe and all of this, but he was never had that quality of a Rebbe where, they, where he could really thoroughly control the environment. If the, if the guys who crowded around were a bunch of yeshiva guys and they, were, and they wanted to hack, so he reverted a little bit, you know. So that was a funny, a very interesting thing if you lived through it and you, and you experienced it. 
It was interesting about him. But it was a beautiful side of him also because he in his heart he was a Zirbach. He could go he could be transformed back there. And uh but why did your father break away from him? So my again, you know, uh after he started having contact with women, inappropriate contact. So a lot of guys broke away. So I'm um, I know he, I I think I told you this off the record before. But the uh, and uh, Rabbi Rabbi Cohen is still alive. He should live and be well, not as well as he was. But I think he still takes Shilas every day. And yeah. So he's he's hanging in there, and uh, and he. Uh, this was the crazy story that happened to Chaim My father told me part of it, and Rabbi Cohen's son Ami, who lives in Monty, he's a great guy. Uh, he told me the other part of it that his father told him. But essentially, what happened was that at a certain that Rav Hutna was trying to be Makar of Kalbach. In, in, in the sense that he he felt that he needs a shidduch. But that's his most, that, like the key to everything will be if he gets a shidduch. Right, right. That'll be the solution. Right. He's 25, 26, 27 years old, whatever. He didn't get married until 40 years in the end, the 42. Yeah. Forty. But yeah, but but at that time, when my father was a bacha, so he, he was let's say in his mid to late twenties, and Rav Hutna had the idea: if I get him a shidduch, that'll be the thing. Actually, and, I'm sorry, actually forty seven. But anyway, yeah, right, right, and and then and so that was the thing. So Rav Hutna had this idea: the real solution is to get him a shidduch, and then but he also saw that he was having a problem with parnasa. So Rav Hutna wanted to figure that if he helps him. Make more panasa, he'll help him get a shidduch. And uh, see, that was he, he was trying to mat, put all the pieces together. So he'll bring him into the uh, to learn in the yeshiva, and he'll give him a job, and he'll help him with shidduch. And if it all comes together, that might be the solution. This is before he was doing concerts. Excuse me. <coughs> so what happened was, uh, when he came into Chaim Berlin, they, they, they treated him with very high respect in the learning category. And they put him into the Shabura uh, that was not in the regular, the, where the best manager of Chaim Berlin was still in Farakale or, or in Bronzeville, but but they had Kyle Goraya, which was in Crown Heights. Yeah. On President Street. Right. And the Kyle Goraya was either married guys, Kyle guys, or the top of them who were like two classes ready to just be with the 18 year olds. So they, he put Kabach over there. And uh, and in fact, uh, he learned the Chavrusa with Rabbi Anderson David Shlita, that's your foot in the son of Yes. Who's, uh, you know, over 90 years old. Uh, Kabach went to Chavrusa with him, you know, regular. Uh, and they were learning. And I was told that in that's mind that he was Chavrusa with Rabbi Anderson. They were learning Tur Evan Ha'ezah. That was the equally. I mean, then you went back to the Gemara. So, you know, you were learning yeah. the Torah, and you went back to the Gemara. Yeah, find the sources. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, as you said, not everyone here is is is, is schooled in the in the levels of of the you know the so the Talmud, of course, is the basic. Uh, well, no, 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 let, so, let's go on because time's yeah. up. Yes, let's go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that, that was the thing we were trying to try to do for him, and but then he was he was doing starting to do concerts a little bit while he was there. And uh, and the word came out that a uh, a woman went up on the stage. I think in Montreal. I don't know why that's in my head. May or may not be accurate. A woman came up on the stage and kissed him. Now he well, he didn't do any effort to bring that about. She just spontaneously did. It. And it was you don't forget it's the era where the rock groups are starting. You know, it's a funny time. And I mean, not quite, but it's already getting. Yeah, the 50s, the Fonzarellis, the Fonzarellis. Yeah, 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 the musical world is trying to heat up in the funny ways. And uh, and he was, just, in certain ways, built to people like that. So, uh, so Rafutna decided that he has to leave this year. But he didn't want to throw him out. So what he did was he deputized Rav David Cohen to throw him out as a, as a peer. In other words, he, the, he should tell him as a peer, it's time for you to leave. So he told Rav David Cohen to do it. And now Rav David Cohen uh, was, was a fiery individual. 
and uh, famously uh, jumped up during the Gersh of Salvatic's hospital of, of the Chazanes and the Briskorov to say that he was Maikhan, that he wasn't speaking about them with the with the right covenant. So you know he was he had was a firebrand, but he was a big tremendous time with Chacham, a young guy, but a firebrand. And uh, and Rufundi gave him the job to throw out Kabbalah. So uh, Rav David Cohen made a meeting with Kabbalah, and he told him, uh, "Now this piece I'm pretty sure I heard from my father. I don't know if Ami confirmed the content, but my father told me that Rav David Cohen said to him that the right solution for you in this matzah would be to kill yourself." <laughs> He says, because the Ivan says that if somebody did public aver and he wants he's allowed to kill himself. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so he said, if, you know, if you would do go anyway, so the point was he kicked him out in a really severe way, like you're not wanted here anymore. Then later, yeah, a few months later, Rev R- Hutner called Rev Dovid Cohen to come to his office. And when David Cohen came, he was, he was, they said, somebody's inside. And you, you're next. And then he hears, whoever's inside, he hears that laughing. It's like Hamish and it. And the door opens, and the slam of Kabbalah comes out. So he was really hot under the collar, you know, like, dude, she was sending me to do the, you know, the dirty work. And, right, kick him. and, and, and he smiled to him. And he's and he's still hanging around with him and working with him, so so he was really and Rufundi either he intentionally arranged it or he certainly wasn't careful that they shouldn't meet. So what happened was when he came in and he says, "Rabbi, how can you do this? You 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 don't want to talk." Double cross, you double crossed me. Yeah, yeah. So he told him, "Small daicha be min Yeah, yeah. The, the left hand pushes away, but the right hand still has to That's draw. right. That's right. And and so. It was a big lesson for Abdul Cohen also to see that he yes. used to play both sides of the fence. So, so he kept the shackles. In later years, in my time as a Bach and Chaimbon, which is a Rehut was much older, obviously, uh, at, at, at a fellow's uh, wedding, uh, Sean Shalom, he passed away a couple of years ago, over Sean, he died young. But he, uh, at the wedding, the guys were in a good mood, you know, and so. They and there used to be a stick. The band would have to stop at eleven. Then the guys would sit at the table without the band and make like it comes. It so they started singing not just Kalbach, but they sang, "Lord, get me high, get me high, get me high, Lord, get me high, get me high." Which of all the the of all the Kalbach songs, the lyrics sort of lend themselves to some kind of a scary interpretation because. It's one thing to say, you know, uh, bring, bring me up, carry me up, uh, elevate me, lift up my soul. There's a lot of, but when he said, get me high, in that period, get me high, I was a drug. So when he said, when he, so in a way, that's how Yeshiva Bach reacted to it. Lord, get me high was, it felt like you were bridging the world between the hippies and the regular people. And uh, and they when they sang that, so somebody snitched to Rav Hutna about it. And Rav Hutna, uh, called all the Bachar man. He was supposed to be giving shit that day, and he said, I can't give shit after this my said that I heard that uh, that they were singing, uh, you know, uh, guys, I, you know, he said something like that, and he walked out, and there was no shit. You know, canceled the shit. So, so, but that also, you know, and now, that's what he said in the public thing, and then he probably told guys that he doesn't really want to encourage the senior Kabbalah Bechlau, but, but, but his official objection was because they used the, that English uh, thing that's what they said. So, so there was always this kind of tension where... I'm sorry, the, I didn't hear that last sentence. You want the, the official what? No, his official reason for objecting was the content of the of the words. Oh, the Lord, words. get me high. Yeah, referring right, right. to drugs, right. Right. Okay, but, but what was your personal... Your personal... Okay, so... So now with this back, so and my father explained to me this whole thing about how he lent him the twenty bucks with yeah, and how they used to go to the Pioneer Country Club together. Yeah, we got and, it. And all of that, and the background, and the yeah. hang out, and and my father 
I had this I idea in his head. Nothing just happened to your sound. Nothing happened. Oh, now, now you go. Now you go. Yeah, so, uh, so my father, in his mind, had he just understood it like this was a guy. He couldn't get a shinder. He couldn't get a good job. And he kind of drifted into this. He, he didn't see it from the perspective of the lover of Jews who had to go out there and conquer the world. And, and it, just because of his background and his relationship with him, he could he could never see that other person. Maybe much later, because once I much later, once I was I brought in Kavas music into the house, the newest stuff, and my father would listen more and more, and then he began to understand. Like you could see a, a change in attitude there. So like, wow, this guy actually went out and made a movement. He, he wasn't just a guy who drifted off, you know. And so I, I think in a way, my father is a symbol of like the whole yeshiva of the world, is like a microcosm. Because the first, and, and you, even in Chassidim, you, you point out in your book, a lot of Chassidim looked at it that way. Because the beginning, you're just a guy who drifted off. And he's being, doing strange things, and he's, uh, he's hanging out with hippies. And what's going on? But the fact is that over the years, uh, you started seeing people coming back from, who, who met him in some crazy place, and that had shown up, going to yeshivas, going to regular Hasidic uh, environment. And, you know, and 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 then you realize this guy, he, he's not really lost out there. He's actually bringing people back. So uh, I'm not again. There's nothing you can learn from him like there's no like okay, do it, come out there and you'll succeed. No, nobody's saying that. But on the Mafreya, we do see that he had certain basic. What, what does Lechatchila mean and what does Lechatchila mean? Lechatchila means when someone asks you, is this advisable? You know what I mean? So you say, you know, should I buy a lottery ticket? No, it's not advisable. You got a one in a million chance. Then the next day when the guy won, you know, the guy won with the lottery ticket, so what do you want? It, 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 it kind of changes the calculus. Right. And uh, yeah, I always tell this to people, I say, if a thing has a 70% chance of failure, and you happen to succeed, it doesn't prove anything. And if a thing has a 70% chance of success and you happen to fail, it also doesn't prove anything. It's hard for the human being to think that way. Okay, but... okay, so let's get back to Karl Bach, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so with Karl Bach, so I'll tell you a, a couple of uh, things that I, where I really learned to respect him even more. I love the music, and I built a little bit of a relationship with him, which I haven't fully described it. But let me, I want to go around to some people who I met and things I learned from them about Kaaba. Right. What we're going to do is in five minutes or so, seven minutes, we're going to end and then I'm going to send another Zoom so we'll do another session. Okay? okay. That's great. So uh, after Kaaba passed away in 1994, uh, the next time I traveled to Israel, a few months later, for whatever, I don't know, whatever I went for, I don't remember. But I, 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 made an effort to find Amuna Witt. Amuna Witt, W-I-T-T, she was, she had done an issue of a magazine, a retrospective magazine where she interviewed people, or people wrote in uh, reminiscences about Kaaba. And then she said she wants to do at least a few more, maybe make it a regular thing for her. So I, I found out where she lives and I went to meet her to give her 50 bucks or 100 bucks. And I said, I want to be part of this. I think what you're doing is valuable. I want to be part of it. So, and she had never met me before, you know. So I came to her house, and these kids everywhere. These, she's, she's got teenagers, young kids. Uh, kids are sitting learning. She's Lebed, she's Lebed. It's Lebed, yeah. There's kids learning. There's kids playing the guitar. Anyway, so I smoothed with her. She was very touched because she didn't solicit money from me. I came specifically. So, right, you, you offered the donation. Yeah. yeah, so she was very touched. And she gave me the story. Now, at that time, she told me she had 14 kids, and she was very pregnant with the 15th while she's talking. And then, you know, <laughs> it was unbelievable. And so she says to me, you know, after I heard this, it was like, you know, I said, this is real hell dimension. Holy people. Right. She says that she was 14 years old in Detroit, Michigan. No, no, not in Detroit. I'm sorry. She uh, maybe in in a different city, but she was fourteen years old, and she was already like had run away from home basically, 
Uh, she had no. Uh, she was in complete class with her parents. She was not religious at all, and and, uh, and somebody said, "Come with to Kalbach. He's giving a concert." So she went to this concert when she was very moved by, it. and afterwards the the friends who brought her took her over to meet Shlomo. They said, "This girl is fourteen years old, and we need to do something for her. She's you know the parents are giving up." So he said, "Okay." I'm going to get you. I'm going to take care of you. So he called Rip Schleim uh, Goldstein, I think his name was. Yeah. From Detroit. That's Detroit, yeah. And who, he was the head of the base shock in Detroit. And the famous story with the song Eilecha, which maybe I'll tell you after. But it, it, so Rip Schleim Goldstein was always close with Kalmach. But he had a regular base Yaakov with regular girls from, from healthy religious houses. Right. He wasn't going to start bringing in people from scary yeah. backgrounds. So Schleiman called him and said, you have to take this girl. She's 14. She's starting high school. She, you know, she, she'll know less than the kids who had eight years of elementary. But so what? You can catch up. And you got to take her. And he said, he said, Schleiman, I can't take a girl like this. She, she knows nothing. She comes from nowhere. She and maybe who knows the negative stuff is going on you're 14 years old ran away from home I get it. I'm not equipped for this he said to him if you don't take this girl you're going to go and take a hand up. you must take this girl alright so he took her in and she became a regular basic aqua girl in, uh, in Detroit and then she said to me that he called her every Arab Shabbos all four years of high school, every Arab Shabbos, she she almost never saw him because she didn't come back around. She says he called me from Israel, he called me from Australia, he called me from Europe. He, wherever he was, he took him in on Arab Shabbos to call this girl and check it. And then I'm standing there, she's got four kids. It, it's, it's just unbelievable what you can do with a little regards for a human being, a little love for someone that is not his kid. Right. It, you know, so so you saw you you saw with you heard it and saw it from the person. Right. So with, four, with 14 kids and a 15 coming pregnant. Right. And all the kids are learning and they did. And those kids, by the way, a lot of his things that are printed from him are from his kids said her kids sat and transcribed. Right. Kids transcribed from the tapes and they wrote right, right, right. <laughs> so you know, once you once you saw that, you could understand why Sam is giving him this unbelievable backing after death that his songs are everywhere and they and right. And they, I want to I want to ask you, Rabbi Yaakov, did you um ever hear him speak or did you speak to him about the? the I I I, if I I wrote it I think in, in the book I did, but I heard a tape. I have a tape. I don't even I don't know where it is, but I heard it and I, I won't forget it because it struck me while I was living in Los Angeles in the in the mid nineties in the early nineties. And he said to someone, he said that you know I I'm a, I'm I'm so upset they don't accept me. They don't yeah. accept me. No, and that's who true. I, and who is the day? The Fruma Yidin, the Orthodox right. Jews, and not just the Orthodox, the Hasidim, the literature, you know, right. no, the Lekrem, the Bnei Torah, you know, you know right, right. people, where he comes from, where, you know, yeah. Lakewood, Lubavitch, you know what I'm saying, um, his own family background, and, and, and it ate him up. Yeah, I, I, no, I that's it. true. I know that. that I, I but, know that. But, but did, did he ever? Did you ever hear him speak about that? That's what. Yeah, I yeah, a little bit. I I heard it a little bit that he yeah. uh, not in those those terms. I heard that in second hand, but but in, but he he clearly, you know, he would say like they they don't appreciate what he's doing, and and then he said when he had the radio show. I don't know if you know he had a radio show in New York. No, I didn't know. I didn't know when. Yeah. Uh, Maybe 1990, something like that. I, he started with a few interviews on Zeb Brenner, and uh, who's still around there out there yeah. doing, doing his thing, and uh, and then 
they said, you know what? And somebody bought him some time and he did like an hour a week or something. And and people would call in and ask him questions. And, uh, and so if anyone has tapes of those shows, they're very interesting. I, I think they released a few I, over the years. I've heard some very interesting things from those shows. Right. So it was, it was very revealing. You know, I remember a guy called into the show and said, uh, is it true that, uh, you know, that Arjun Sharma's or, is, or your first song? And he said, no, 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 that's my fourth. <laughs> Simcha Lachach is the first song, you know, something like that. So it, people would ask him these, they, give him a chance to explain some things. So yeah, that was an interesting period. If you got those tapes, they're very revealing. Anyway, uh, the thing I wanted to say was about he was definitely bothered that that people didn't accept him as much as he as he apparently he thought. They okay, should. but 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 he was a smart man. He understood right, right. why. He understood no, I think, why right. I, think I think you know the 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 intellectual side of his brain probably understood. But but I, I'll tell you something. I used to say this when I was growing up, and I used to say it with a lot more anger than I say it now. Now I just say it. But I used to say, "Don't you understand that when by being Marachi, these people, all you're doing is making them worse." And 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 uh in the you know, means by distancing. This no no yeah, I said like Shlomo Kalbach, Mayor Kahani, uh even Rabbi Yashabar Salvation. you know, if, if if you ever push a a person out, then you're squeezing them, then a lot of what they can accomplish, but with their unique element, it, it's like Khoslamachas outside the camp. It, it can be as and 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 also the the camp is supposed to keep you honest, but but it doesn't. If it's gonna be too rigid, then it doesn't keep anyone okay. honest. Okay. But did you did, did you were did you or were you present when anyone confronted him and said, Shleima, why are you doing this?" Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, on the radio show, people called him and said to him that you know you're kissing women, and, and so now it's interesting because. Uh, I think that evolved over the years into into a pretty much of a of a an, an impersonal system. Like you know, it could it could even I don't want to say I lost his view, but but it, it was he had it down to a thing where even though it's, it was his way of showing warmth to people, but it it was so you're doing it with everybody. It became so impersonal that it really. It, it, you know, again, I don't want to go into the Allah part of it. That you can, you know, leave to the person. But I'm just saying that, you know, when he was younger and maybe, he, you know, he didn't have a shit, you know, I don't know what. We are. But, the, right. but later on, when, when, on the movement part of it, when he would do that at all the concerts, he, he, was, he wasn't making any real connection other than like a, a momentary thing. So I, I, I don't know exactly. Right. It's not the judge. But uh, but the fact is, uh, I'll give you uh, on that per, on that on that point. There's one story that I know that nobody in the world knows. That that how also, long is it going to be? Because otherwise you have to. Okay, very section. very fast, very fast. Yeah. We, uh, when, when I lived in Chicago, we had a lady who was a babysitter. Yeah, we well, used her as a babysitter. Maybe we shouldn't have, because she was like of limited intelligence, and. Uh, she was, you know, one of these kind of women who got one minute home, who lived at home with her mother, and she was always going to live at home with her mother. You know, she never got married. You could, yeah. she, she could tell that, right, right. And she wasn't very bright, but just enough to function. And she went to this concert, and and he and he spoke to her and and and, and made her feel so important. And he took her phone number, and I, I you know. No, nobody who's a who's a player was interested in this woman. Trust me, it was just pure obviously so. And when well, let's continue in the next segment because we're going to get cut off. So um, yeah. this is the first segment with Rep. Yaakov Hamnik uh, talking about the Flame Karbach today. Uh, the Test Zion Mar This is your site, and um, and in his honor and his memory, we we brought this program, and we'll continue very soon in Mitzvah The next. Sections, I zoom, hapslach, bye.